We all know that one person who truly inspires us to do better in our own lives. That one person who works hard every single day to be the person who can be the change that they want to see in the world. Whether we see them on social media doing amazing things for their fellow human or if it's someone you know in your personal life. But no matter how you know this person, you want what's best for them and you want them to continue doing what they love because it can impact so many people in such a positive way. That is how so, so many people felt about Pavela Payer. But unfortunately, her life was taken from her in such a brutal way for absolutely no reason. And so many are left with the heartache of losing someone who could have gone on to do so much for the world around her. But before we get into Pava's case, I want to say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Morgan & Morgan. Morgan & Morgan is America's largest injury law firm with over 800 attorneys operating in 49 states. At Morgan & Morgan, you get more than just your traditional law firm. You get a national consumer-facing firm that has the promise of being for the people. Now, contacting a personal injury attorney should be the first step that you take after a car accident. It's a no-brainer and costs you nothing unless they win. Plus, with Morgan & Morgan, they make it so easy. There's no need for you to visit a law office and sit through long consultations. You submit a claim and have your lawyer review your case with only eight clicks on your phone. With their modernized injury law process, they make it easy to submit a claim. You submit your case details, sign contracts, upload documents, and medical records all from your cell phone. You can even text your attorney and legal team throughout the duration of the case. So, if you do ever get into an accident, contact Morgan & Morgan. They can help you determine if you have a case, and if you do, it costs you nothing unless they win. Don't overthink it. Take action to protect your rights, and Morgan & Morgan will fight to get the compensation you deserve. So, submit your claim at forthepeople.com slash Rachel Shannon, which is linked down below, or by dialing pound law or pound 529 on your phone. Again, to submit your claim, head to forthepeople.com slash Rachel Shannon, which will be linked down below. Thank you again so much to Morgan & Morgan for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the devastating case of Pavel LaPierre. Pavel LaPierre was born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. According to her father, Frank, Pava had always been a leader from a very young age. She was stubborn and sly, with her father fondly remembering how she would sneak out of the home to ride her bicycle growing up, only to sneak back in before her parents could ever notice. She was always a very driven child and young adult. She was creative, hardworking, and relentless in her efforts. She made an impact in every endeavor she undertook and touched every life she was a part of. Pava was a graduate of Catalina Foothills High School in Tucson before she went on to study at John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, originally studying to become a doctor. Her peers at John Hopkins remember her as being a brilliant student. She was motivated, and other students looked to her as an example. She was known as being mature for her age, helping other students in her classes study and succeed in their academics. Now, it was said that while Pava was in college, she happened to see some images of the ongoing conflicts happening in Syria, and in that moment, she felt something shift in her soul. She saw grotesque images of young children being trapped in the war-torn rubble, bleeding from wounds, or not breathing at all. She just felt that it wasn't fair that she was living such a good life in such a great part of the world while there were children all over the world suffering from some of the greatest atrocities. At the same time, she was studying on a path towards medical school. But after seeing these images and changing her outlook on life, she decided she needed to start figuring out ways that she could help those in need. According to a seminar she once held during her senior year of college, 
Pava said that she became obsessed with the idea of helping as many people as possible become entrepreneurs. She said that if she wants to make change in the world, they need to make even more entrepreneurs who can set out and make even more change. It was a domino effect. So when Pava was only 22 years old and in her final year of college from her dorm room, Pava got to work on building her startup companies and seeing what would work. By the time she graduated from university in 2019, Pava built three startup ventures dedicated to empowering young and aspiring business leaders. One of the startups was called Innovate MD, which was a nonprofit dedicated to supporting student entrepreneurs in Maryland. Another one of those startups was Ecomap Technologies, which took off and jumpstarted her career in technology. One of her fellow co-founders of Ecomap, Sherrod, remembers being introduced to Pava. He was a friend of a man who was mentoring Pava, and when he heard that Sherrod was looking for a startup to join, he was introduced to Pava. He described himself as a dumb business guy who was partnering with a brilliant visionary, and somehow they made the most amazing team. He described that it was a yin-yang type of relationship, or salt and pepper. They were complementary to one another. Sherrod described that Pava had this way of seeing things that nobody else could. She created what they called an ecosystem, something that is all around us, but something that you cannot see. It is made up of organizations, resources, people, and activity and interaction between them. From there, Pava used that idea of an ecosystem as the foundation for her company. That helped her build her company from the ground up, and eventually, her company became more than just a job. It was her life's work. Ecomap aims to connect people with the networks, resources, and social capital that they need to progress in industries and communities that may be difficult to break into alone, tech, nonprofits, and small businesses. According to Ecomap's website, they were founded on a simple premise, quote, It should be easy to access information about what's happening in the ecosystems all around us. We use powerful technology to digitize ecosystems, ensuring anyone can easily access the information they need so ecosystems can be as equitable, efficient, and effective as possible. In the summer before coming to Hopkins, I was watching news coverage of the war on Syria. And there was a video of a car bombing, killed 30 people, most of them children. And I remember feeling absolutely devastated, not just at the massive human tragedy, but because that video forced me, somebody whose life and safety have always been reasonably guaranteed, to reckon with the fact that despite the fact that we all inhabit the same world, we live in entirely different ones. So that started me on this morbid investigation into everything that is wrong with the world. And boy, is there a lot. <laughs> you know, there are millions of people suffering every day from preventable, or rather, should be preventable problems. Another thing I realized in my investigation <laughs> is that if you really wanted to see what made big change in the world, what really got something moving, in a certain direction. You had to follow the money. So I decided that if I wanted to make change on a larger scale, I should go into business. And so I became obsessed with this idea of helping as many people as possible become entrepreneurs. And I feel like this needs a little bit of explanation, because when I say entrepreneur, I do not mean the tech bros in hoodies building the next Uber for puppies, right? Entrepreneurs are an incredibly diverse bunch. It is everybody from the small business owner supporting their local economy to the doctor introducing life-changing medical devices onto the market. But what unites them all is a desire to bring something new into the world. And so I started two more ventures to do my small part at addressing this issue. One was Innovate Maryland a nonprofit that supports young entrepreneurs across the state and works to keep talented graduates within the city. And then leaving my nonprofit safety net, Ecomap Technologies, a company that uses automation to map out entrepreneurial ecosystems, making it easy for any entrepreneur to find the resources that they need to build a venture. My goal became to reduce the barriers to entry to becoming an entrepreneur 
because somebody should not need to go to a top 10 institution, or any institution for that matter, to be an entrepreneur. Sherrod continued describing Pava as scrappy, a little bullheaded, and hard-charging. When the world told her no for one reason or another, she refused to accept it. She built an incredible team of 32 people total, which was full of diversity of thought, background, gender, and age. And to Pava, the people who worked for her weren't just her employees. They were her family. They managed to raise over $4 million in capital, secured contracts all across the country with major institutions. Pava also grew to love the city of Baltimore. It is where she wanted to build her company, where she wanted to be successful. She wanted to help the people of Baltimore specifically, and overall, she wanted to make the world and her community a better place. With her personal profile and company on the rise, Pava developed a reputation for herself and was widely known as a go-getter. She was an inspiration to other women who wanted to run the show like she was. By the ripe age of 25, Pava made it to the Forbes 30 under 30 list for social impact in 2023. According to the Forbes website, quote, EcoMap curates data about all the organizations, resources, and other assets within any ecosystem from a city's tech community to an entire industry and puts that information into free platforms that enables users to navigate them. With over $4 million raised and a team of nearly 30, the John Hopkins grad runs a company whose clients include the Aspen Institute, Meta, the WXR Fund, and the T. Rowe Price Foundation. If you were to look at her Facebook, you would see just how much of an impact Pava had on so many lives. So many people who looked up to her, who loved her, and are inspired by what she has accomplished in such a short amount of time. I know that I'm spending a lot of time talking about Pava, and some of you might think it's too much, but I genuinely feel touched by Pava. The more I learn about her, the more I want to know. And I want people to remember Pava for all of the incredible things that she has done in her 26 years and not what was done to her in her final days. I try to find out as much as possible about every victim that we discuss here, and I try to do that with every single case. But Pava specifically, she just seemed like the most amazing person that you could know. Now, by Monday, September 25th, 2023, a friend noticed that she hadn't seen or heard from Pava in several days. The last time anyone heard from her was that previous Friday, and it wasn't like Pava at all to be out of contact with her friends and to stop showing up for the work that she loved so much. So, one friend reported Pava as a missing person to the Baltimore Police Department. According to a neighbor of Pava's, it appears that police responded to her apartment to see if she was okay, basically just by knocking at her door for a wellness check. But when they got no answer, they just sort of left. However, only hours after reporting Pava as a missing person, it was reported that the same person actually found Pava's body. It appeared that the friend went over to Pava's upscale Mount Vernon apartment and started looking around for her when they made the very gruesome discovery. 26-year-old Pava was found lying face up, partially naked, and badly beaten on the roof of the apartment building. Of course, after making the discovery, police were called once again, who arrived to the apartment shortly after by 11.34 a.m. By the time first responders arrived, unfortunately, there was nothing they could do to save Pava. She was pronounced dead at the scene. Upon looking around at the scene of where Pava's body was found, they found that there was blood all over her body, a brick that was covered in blood, a broken hair clip, as well as a red pair of shoes that were thought to be Pava's located near her body. At the time, it appeared that somebody must have climbed up on a ladder on the side of the building to gain access to the roof, and then that person came in contact with Pava and then left that same way after killing her. According to one veteran officer who was among the first responders who discovered her body, the way Pava was found was one of the worst cases of beatings that he has ever seen. After finding Pava's body, of course, she was sent off to the medical examiner's office who conducted an autopsy on her body by Tuesday, September 26th. 
After conducting the autopsy, her cause of death was determined to be the result of blunt force trauma to her head, as well as strangulation. Pava had been brutally beaten and strangled to death. Now, of course, after finding her badly beaten body, police started their investigation into who could have possibly been responsible. The last time that Pava was seen alive was on Friday, September 22nd, so that is the day in which police believe she was killed. However, the apartment building where Pava lived is known to be very secure. It's actually known as being a very safe, secure apartment building where people live specifically to avoid the higher crime areas. The only people who are allowed in are people who lived there or people who were let in by people who lived there. So at first, it was an absolute mystery how someone this violent could have gotten into that apartment building. Luckily, her apartment building does have surveillance cameras, so Pava's last moments were captured on video. So, on that Friday, Pava was walking home to her Baltimore apartment, arriving to the apartment lobby at around 11.23 p.m. As she was walking, a man was seen following closely behind. After entering the lobby, she sat down on the couch until the same man that was seen following her also arrived to the apartment. He looked through the glass door of the lobby and waved at Pava to get her attention. She then got up to let him into the lobby and chatted with him for a while. After chatting for a few minutes, the two then got on the elevator together. The man is described as a tall, bald, light-skinned black male wearing black glasses and a gray hoodie and black sweatpants. A little while after that, the man is seen leaving the apartment building's stairwell, headed into the lobby, looking rushed and hurried, carrying his gray hoodie in his hand and scrambling to find an exit. He then locates the front door and is seen wiping his right hand on his shorts before reaching out to touch the door to open the door and exit the apartment building. So it is thought that this is the man who murdered Pava within that very short period of time. According to reports, it does not appear that Pava knew this man, but it did seem to be a targeted attack with the man specifically wanting to hurt Pava. It seemed that he followed her home, watched her enter her apartment building, and then he got her attention and was probably coming up with some story about how he forgot his keys or something. So being the open-minded, kind-hearted person that she was, she let him in. Then he struck up a conversation with her, which gained her trust enough to get on the elevator with him. Pava lived on the seventh floor, so maybe he said he lived on that floor as well. Then at some point, he may have either convinced her to go on the roof with him and hurt her there, or he killed her somewhere else in the building, most likely her own apartment unit, and then carried her body up to the roof to cover up the crime though I don't know why he would put her in a more public area to cover up the crime rather than just leaving her in her apartment, but maybe he didn't know if she had roommates or something like that that would be coming home later. We don't really know why she was found on the roof. All we know is that she was found there and there was some sort of reason that he was able to get her up there, but we don't know what that reason is right now. What we also still don't know, and what I haven't been able to find anywhere, is where Pava was before she returned home that evening. Was she working late? Was she with friends at the bar or something? Was she at a friend's house? Was she hanging out alone somewhere? That is significant to me because that can give us an idea of how this man could have spotted her and why he chose specifically to follow Pava. Also, as a note, the surveillance video that showed her movements that has not been made public as far as I have been able to find. The arrest warrant is what outlines her movements that night, but I haven't been able to see them for myself, so just so you know, that's why I didn't include the video in here. Either way, after looking into that surveillance video, it wasn't long before police identified the suspect. That was because this man was already very well known to law enforcement. The man seen in video in Pava's apartment building was 32-year-old Jason Billingsley, who had a long and violent criminal history and who had just been recently released from prison less than a year before allegedly killing Pava. So, let's talk about what we know about Jason Billingsley. Jason Billingsley has a criminal history that dates back to 2009 and included multiple charges of attempted rape, sexual assault, multiple charges of assault, armed robbery, and false imprisonment, as well as multiple probation violations. 
In one of those cases, Jason robbed a man of literally $10 after punching him in the face and causing him to bleed. In 2010, he was accused of punching a then-girlfriend in the face, pinning her down, and stealing her phone. He pled guilty to assault in that case. Then, in another case, there was a woman who told the police that she had gotten into a bad argument with her boyfriend, who is not Jason. So, she left the apartment that she was living in with her boyfriend and started walking down the street to cool off. At that point, a man who introduced himself as Jason approached her, asking her what was wrong and if she had somewhere to stay. She said no, so he offered to bring her somewhere that she could stay with him, so she went with him. When they got to Jason's place, the two sat and talked in his bedroom, but of course, Jason told the woman that he wanted to have sex with her. When he said that, she said that she wanted to leave, but he wouldn't let her. He started hitting her in the face and started choking her and threatening to shoot her if she didn't do what he said. At that point, he had a knife on him, so he held the knife to her and forced her to give him oral sex, which obviously she did to avoid being killed, and then he stole $53 from her wallet and told her to leave. Obviously, this woman reported this to the police, and he was subsequently charged with first and second degree assault, attempted first degree rape, false imprisonment, and theft. He was eventually found guilty and was sentenced to 30 years behind bars for this. However, I guess he was later given a plea agreement, which reduced his sentence to only 14 years behind bars. But he didn't even serve that. So, Marilyn has a diminution credit system, which is a policy that allows inmates to reduce the term of their incarceration through good behavior and completing various educational courses. This is basically a behavioral incentive program to avoid overcrowding in prisons which is a great system for non-violent offenders like the guy that you caught with a bag of weed or the guy you caught selling DVDs on the street corner. But apparently, it's considered for pretty much everybody no matter what your offenses are. So, after serving only nine years of his original 30-year prison sentence in October of 2022, Jason was released from prison on good behavior. This was something that absolutely outraged and downright confused so many people. He was in jail for threatening a woman's life, sexually assaulting her, and leaving her with a lifetime of trauma and fear. That is something that this woman will never get to undo and will be something that she carries with her for the rest of her life. Not only that, but he showed very crystal clear behaviors, which literally screamed from the rooftops, I will not stop doing things like this no matter what happens to me. Someone who is in and out of prison for essentially their entire life for assault after assault after robbery after sexual assault after attempted rape and then another sexual assault, that is not someone who should be considered for good behavior. Of course, they can show good behavior behind bars because they know they're being watched. They are not free to do whatever they please. They don't get to follow women home and stalk them. They are surrounded only by other violent men who they wouldn't stand a chance against most of the time. Of course, monsters can appear to be better when they are in an environment that does not allow them to hurt women. No one who rapes women, or anybody for that matter, should ever be allowed out, and especially not early. Then, when we add to the fact that he was literally in prison after a woman was raped and left alive to report it to the police. We have seen in a countless number of cases that these men will rape women, they will go to jail for it, and then they come out and do the same exact thing, but this time, they don't leave a witness. Patterns like this happen so often, yet it continues to go ignored. It is infuriating. But no matter what my or anybody else's opinions are, the facts don't change. Jason Billingsley was released early from prison after sexually assaulting and threatening the life of another woman. But killing Pava actually was not the first crime that he committed after being released early. Turns out that on September 19th, 2023, Police were already searching for Jason after reports of arson. It turned out that Jason went to a home where this couple he knew lived. It's reported that Jason knew the couple because he worked as a maintenance man for the area. He went to the door of the home and initially identified himself as the maintenance man. But he ended up kicking in the door and holding the couple at gunpoint. 
He then tied up both the man and the woman with duct tape before repeatedly raping the woman. He then allegedly slit the woman's throat, trapped both of them, both the man and the woman, in the basement, and then set both the man and woman on fire before fleeing the building. Neighbors reported that on that day, they woke up to the sound of a smoke detector going off and the sound of screaming. The neighbor said that he went outside to see what was going on, and he saw that the woman was screaming and banging on the grate of the basement window, trying to get out. So, the neighbor ran over to the home, got the grate off, and pulled both the man and the woman out of the basement. He saw that the man was bound and was bleeding, so the neighbor immediately knew that they had been attacked and that this wasn't just a freak fire and that they had accidentally gotten trapped down there. They had been attacked and this had been a purposely set fire. Thankfully, both the man and the woman survived this attempt on their lives, but they were left with serious injuries and third-degree burns. The couple also did have a child in the apartment, but thankfully, the child was not harmed and was left in a separate bedroom, so hopefully the kid didn't have to witness what happened to the couple, who I would assume are the child's parents. After this event, police figured out that they were looking for Jason and they issued a warrant for his arrest on charges of rape and arson, but they didn't notify the public of the imminent threat that he posed to the public because they didn't think that they had evidence to believe that he would commit random acts of violence. Police said that in relation to the couple, he knew the building, he knew the couple, so they didn't think that he was out there just committing random acts of violence against people he didn't know. Since his release that past October, he hadn't been connected to any other crimes, so he went almost a year without being caught for another crime. I was about to say he went almost a year without committing another crime, but that's probably not true. He probably just hadn't been caught up to that point. So, I guess they had no reason to believe that he would commit any other random acts of violence. Which, even that makes no sense to me because even if he is only going after people that he knows, the public should still be notified because especially if he is using his job as a maintenance worker to go after people, that should be a red flag that he's going after people who might not really know him that well, people who will not suspect that he is going to be around them or going to try to break in, and even people that do know him personally, maybe they don't know that he was released from prison. Maybe they don't know that he's still committing crimes. People still deserve to know if this person is going out there and raping people and setting them on fire. So, the fact that it was like, oh, it wasn't random, so we didn't notify anybody. That made absolutely no sense. But either way, now we know that not only was this monster released early on an attempted rape charge, even though he did force her to give him oral sex, but he raped a woman and attempted to murder two people after being released, and police did not put out a notice for the public to keep an eye out. Maybe if news had spread about this violent criminal, Pava would have recognized him and wouldn't have let him into her apartment building. So, 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 so many mistakes could have prevented this young, brilliant mind from being murdered so brutally. So, after connecting Jason to the murder of Pava, as well as the attempted murder and rape of another couple, a manhunt began. According to police, they immediately put out all efforts and resources to locate this man who stood at 6 feet 4 inches tall, weighing 305 pounds. They desperately searched for Jason for 11 days before he was finally spotted. By September 30th, 2023, he was located at the Bowie train station in Maryland, sitting under an awning with an unidentified man. His arrest was captured on surveillance video, which actually, his arrest was captured on surveillance video, which has been released. On the video, we see U.S. Marshals shining their flashlights directly on Jason, with another aiming his rifle at Jason as they walk towards him. Both men raised their arms and surrendered as other police officers surrounded them, getting Jason on his belly and on the ground, cuffed him, and arrested him. Then, many officers are seen leading Jason out of the station with his arms cuffed behind him. The other man that Jason was seen with was also arrested, but he was released later that same night. He may have been a friend of Jason's or something, but we don't know exactly who he is, but apparently he didn't do anything wrong other than associating with a psychopath. 
basically. After finally apprehending Jason Billingsley, he was charged with attempted murder, arson, and rape for the September 19th attacks, as well as first-degree murder in connection to Pava. As of right now, Jason has been indicted on these charges, and I believe he has been denied bail and is now awaiting his trial in jail. What I can confirm in reference to this incident and the reference to the incident on September 29th, right now all the indications are that this was not a random act of violence. We have information to believe that the victims from Edmondson Avenue were targeted by the suspect, that the suspect knew the victims, and he went into that location for a uh, criminal reason. We know that the victim and suspect were known to each other. Additionally, we know that the victim, did, the suspect, did not break into the building as he worked at that location. Through witness testimony and surveillance, we were able to develop the identity of the suspect, and a warrant was issued for him for Edmondson Avenue within hours. <clears throat> I can confirm that the warrant was a priority, and we brought in our law import, import, enforcement partners from the U.S. Marshals as well as a flyer was distributed to every single officer in the Baltimore Police Departments. <clears throat> our detectives, alongside our partners at the Marshals, were monitoring and surveilling to, surveilling to apprehend the suspect. This includes tracking his phone, looking at financial transactions, looking at social media, surveilling known addresses, speaking to multiple witnesses, and listening to his previous jail calls. Additionally, there were several instances in which we were able to track a close proximity of his location, however, he was still able to elude. As a matter of fact, we had the press conference the other day about Ms. LaPierre's de death. We were delayed that press conference because we were within about 88 meters of capturing the suspect, but he was able to elude our capture. We knew early on that the risk, that the risk was when we went public that the suspect would go underground, which is exactly what he did. As soon as the news uh, conference happened the other day, he basically left the location where he was at. Um, we did a search warrant at one location. He had just left because he saw the news conference. In reference to the homicide of Ms. LaPierre, we are still processing all evidence to determine exactly what occurred. We do know that there was no forced entry in the apartment building as this was a secured building. I want to be very clear that in reference to both incidents and throughout these investigations, all information that was provided was based on preliminary details available at the time. Every BPD officer received notification of the warrant on September 20th, and they were aggressively trying to capture the individual and to locate his whereabouts and take him into custody. Since then, he has been continued to be our number one priority until his capture last night. In the aftermath of this grisly murder, Pava's family came out to say that they are just happy to finally have some closure in this case, and they look forward to justice being served. They thanked the police for their tireless efforts in the manhunt for Jason and during the investigation into Pava's death. They continued, quote, We are relieved to know that he can no longer hurt innocent victims. While this doesn't change that Baltimore lost one of its most passionate, influential fans, our efforts remain focused on remembering and celebrating Pava Marie, her life, her success, and her legacy. As for Pava's company, they have released a statement of their own. They held a vigil to remember Pava and everything she has done for them and the world at large with their company. Of course, they want to continue on her mission, stating, quote, We are in a very strong position as we head towards year end. Not only have we built a category-defining company and generated strong revenue momentum, but we've also weathered perhaps the most difficult situation a young company can face and shown our resilience and determination as a team in the face of unimaginable circumstances. In a powerful legacy for Pava, we plan to accelerate EcoMap forward. Right now, there is a lot of debate on the merit within the Baltimore prisons and other prisons that use the same system and whether or not violent offenders should be allowed good behavior early releases. This is a very heavy topic that people on either side are very passionate about. Right now, violent sex offenders who have committed crimes against people under the age of 16 are not considered for the early release program, which is, I guess, a good thing but other violent offenders are. So, I guess if someone commits rape and false imprisonment of a grown woman, as long as they're on their best behavior in prison, they can be released early. Right now, the governor of Maryland said that he agrees that Jason should have never been released. He doesn't think that anybody with sexual assault or rape-related charges should be released early. 
However, other supporters of the early release system disagree, saying that the system is a part of their rehabilitation and that everybody should be given the chance to show their worth. So that's a pretty big debate going on right now. But I think that the people who are staunch supporters of the early release program are looking at these people with rose-colored lenses. I understand that there are so many people out there who want to see the best in the world and truly believe that everybody deserves a second chance and that everybody can get better no matter their past. But the harsh reality is, is that once you kill someone or once you rape someone, you should never get a second chance. You have to be a special kind of evil to rape or sexually assault someone, leaving that person scarred for life. And that type of person will never get better. So no, violent offenders who rape and or kill should never be released. It's just not worth it to put every single woman who walks that town or state at risk just so you can hope, fingers crossed, that this six foot four, 300 pound monster will do better and won't rape again after already showing what he is capable of. I support innocent victims, I support women, I support children, and I believe that every single man, woman, and child in this country and around the world deserves a basic level of safety and security. So I'm sorry, but if you have already shown yourself to be a violent sexual deviant or a violent person in general, then you don't get to live with the rest of us. And that's my opinion. Obviously, a lot of people might have a different opinion on this, but that's just what I think. I've seen too many of these cases of people being released and just doing the exact same thing and escalating their crimes because they simply don't want to be caught and they think, I get rid of the witness, I'm just going to get away with it, I can do whatever I want. So these people are never going to get better, in my opinion, and we've seen it so, so, so many times. Obviously, this is a topic that I could talk about forever, but you all get it. I just get worked up when an amazing, inspiring woman like Pava are taken away from the earth just because the justice system wants to give a second chance to violent deviants. It's wrong, it's disgusting, and I just hope that someday the people who see cases like Jason's see the pattern and know that releasing people like this puts everybody in danger, and I hope that they can come to a better decision in the future. But that is all I know for today's case. Police have been tight-lipped on this case. There is still information out there that I have questions on that I haven't been able to figure out, but if I do find out more, I will let you know. As of right now, we don't know the trial date yet. We don't know if there's going to be a trial. I feel like there probably will be, but if there is a trial, I will be following it, of course. So whatever happens with that, I will keep you all updated. I may make another video about this case if we do find out more, but we'll see as this case progresses. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. And now I want to know what your guys' thoughts are. What do you think about Jason's early release? Do you think that that's why Pava was killed? Do you think that she would still be with us today if police released that information after that first rape of that couple? What are your thoughts on the early release system as a whole? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All are going to be linked down below. If you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!